All right. I trust that you're doing good, everybody. And, uh, you know, as things begin to open up in Jesus name, you'll be blessed. You'll be healthy. I had a strange experience happen here yesterday at the radio station as I walked out of the building and went out onto the street here. Um, I went out and went, oh, I could feel it in the spirit. The spirit has changed. The spirit has changed. And I believe, as I've said before, the whole thing with coronavirus is going to mysteriously go away probably as quick as it came in. Okay, that doesn't mean one day, but it, you know, over the course of weeks. Uh, this is really interesting what's going on. But what I want to talk to you about is what is the big picture around all this? What do you think the big picture with the coronavirus is? Um, because we're, we're looking at the small picture, like my house, my job, my work, money, our country, masks, health, blah, da, 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 da. But is there, and I'm saying there is, a big picture that God has in mind concerning coronavirus. And here's what it is. God has raised up China as an adversary to discipline the world, but the West in particular, because of our turning away from God and increasing, increasing wickedness, particularly the perversion that's been legalized in all sorts of things, the, the wickedness, the lying, the cheating, the stealing, the coercion in government and, and everything else that's going on right now. Um, God's raising up China as an adversary. And you go, what? How can God be doing that? Well, let me just tell you, you know, I've come to this passage again and again, Isaiah 10, you know, uh, where God raises up Assyria, and you can check it out in 2 Kings, uh, all around chapter 18, 17, those chapters too, and see the stories of what um, Assyria did. But it sa says here, like uh, Isaiah 10, after the Lord had used the king of Assyria to accomplish his purpose in Jerusalem, he will turn against the king of Assyria to punish him. He's proud and arrogant. But earlier on in chapter 10, he says, um, the destruction is certain for Assyria. He's the rod of my anger. Its military power is a club in my hand. Assyria will enslave my people. They are a godless nation and plunder them, trample them like dust under their feet. But the king of Assyria doesn't know that it is I that sent him. Isn't that interesting? Uh, God raised up the wicked Assyria to discipline his people who are far more wicked. And Assyria didn't know God was doing it. And God says, and, after, and he's a, like a rod of correction in my hand. And after I'm done with Assyria, I'll deal with him. Okay? So th this principle is all over the Bible. I've talked about it before. You can't understand the Bible. And you can't understand current events unless you understand how God works in the world and in the nations this way. <clears throat> and he does raise up adversaries. He even does it on a personal level sometimes, uh, like King uh, Solomon, who in the later years turned away from the Lord and built shrines and idols to please his wives. God raised up an adversary against him and the kingdom was split in two. You know, so th this is a principle in the Lord. So how how is this happening right now, do you think? Because uh, one of the things we see, for example, if I look at 2 Kings, is what the king of Assyria did for, he conquered Israel finally, but in Judah, the southern kingdom, uh, was under the righteous king Hezekiah, but Assyria came in and conquered all the peripheral cities and exacted tribute. It says that in 2 Kings 18, King Sennacherib of Assyria came, he attacked the fortified cities of Judah, he conquered them, and King Hezekiah said, I will pay whatever tribute you demand. Uh, you know, and then it went on to tell what happened, how the army of uh, Assyria wanted to take everything and, and, and God dealt with the Assyrians, okay? But this is what was happening is uh, it was Assyria's attacks taking the peripheral places and then getting tribute. Now that's a pattern that's, I think, the big picture of what's going on with the coronavirus with China. And let me give you some, some things uh, that have happened 
that we know about with China. One is, number one, China has attempted to get control of, of uh, leaders, of media, of industry, of education. In other words, there's a war on, but not a conventional war with weapons. The weapons in the war that we're seeing with China is to use economic in control to bribe and corrupt leaders around the world and get, get them to do their bidding, to create trade deals where you give away the house, more or less, you know, if you if you default, China takes it all um, to get into universities, to to uh, pay universities tons of money, to put pay, uh, university professors on payroll, especially in research, to get them over into China, to divulge the research, take their secrets, to get into uh, corrupting industry, you name it. That's that's the way the plan is. The next thing is that they they have done. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative, where they'll go into countries around the world, countries that don't have a great near of capital, and they'll develop infrastructure like bridges and roads and airports and, and water stations and dams and this and that and the other thing, like Italy, like in Africa, like Kenya, uh, Somalia, or not Somalia, I can't remember where it is. Uh, that's what they're doing. Okay? Control fingers into everything. That's what's been happening. Number two in the plan is then if you can collapse the world's economic system and everybody goes into default, guess what happens? Uh, then in default to China, they now own the road and infrastructure and air, like in Kenya and bridges. This has happened in Kenya. It's happened a bunch of places already. Uh, Italy's raising the alarm about this, that as this economic crisis comes in, China takes over, begins to exact tribute from the nations of the earth, just like Assyria did. China can do that. And we know China's intentions. When the coronavirus was known in November over there, they did nothing about it. They supplanted, you know, they covered it up, covered it up, covered it up. And uh, when they shut down all the flights coming out of Wuhan to Beijing, they let millions, some, I think it's like 50 million people leaving Wuhan province fly into the West to infect the West. This is what's gone on. And now they're threatening nations. They threaten numerous nations with retaliation, economic retaliation. If you say China did this or it's the China virus or whatever, but it is from China. This is where it came from. They're doing this. They're doing the same thing. You see with Assyria, only it's not military. It's economic war. Okay. And uh, <clears throat> then you take over, and they're starting to take over. Collapse the economy, take over. Own the infrastructure. Is that what's coming? And look here in Canada, how Justin Trudeau is, is, keeps on going with China. What's going on? Has China put money somehow in the background into foundations? Who, who's giving money to who? We need investigations of all these politicians with foundations and charities or other sources of income or the family's income. Uh, and what they're finding out, like I just tell you this right now, in the United States, there have been numbers of university professors now arrested for what's going on that I just described. They've just been arrested in the last couple of weeks. Um, so this, this is a live deal. And... Uh, then the fourth thing that happens, of course, is nations that once aligned with the United States, because they're, they're the biggest economy, $21 trillion, and, and, and China was 11. If the United States and West economy collapses, and, you know, China begins to own our minds, and they start to own our corporations, they own our media, they own the, you know, in, no wonder Marxism's taught at the universities. China's given money to the universities and the professors. You know? Uh, no wonder the media hates Donald Trump so much. You ever thought about who owns the media? Six companies, one, two, three, four, five, six companies own 90% of the media in the United States. Who owns those six companies? So... All of this is going on, and what I've got to say is, right now, 
only the United States and President Trump stand between what I said happening and us being able to go back to normal. We're at that, we're that close. We're at that close. Uh, now, God, the big picture is, God, I believe, is using China as a rod of correction right now for the West, for the wickedness, for the perversion. And this requires a, a response from us as the church, turning to the Lord. I've been on my face numerous times, repenting for the sin of our nation, for Canada, for our government, and saying, Lord, have mercy. There's so many who love you here. Don't let the nation go down. Father, bring a great revival to turn back to you. And... Uh, what I mean by that is when the gospel's preached, the power of God comes with mighty conviction, takes hold of people, and won't let them go until they turn back to him. It comes over regions like that, like revivals of the past. And so, uh, Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name for a mighty turning back to you in the church and out. We pray for our nation. We pray for mercy at this time, Lord, that you'd forgive you would deliver, but more than that, you would bring a great awakening and a return to you. So righteousness once again comes into our land and this rod of correction is able to have its work, Father, in Jesus' name. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Now, you know, I, get me straight here. Um, in China, there's so many good people. You know, most of the people are probably wonderful people. People certainly, I've best Asians are just wonderful people all over. But they have a wicked government. Is God using them as a rod of correction? I think so. Um, I want to close with a dream. And uh, it's, a re it's a dream that I've had as a recurring dream for many years. I, I, I don't know how many times I've had this dream. And it's of a great mansion. And this place is enormous. It's actually set like on a city block or kind of a rural looking place, but city block. It would be, oh man, a block or two deep, like a fantastically huge museum kind of a place. Uh, half a block or block wide, this building. And I know um, over the years, I began to explore it. Every time I'd have a dream, I'd be exploring someplace else in this building. And it was like a 19th century, 18th century building uh, that you'd find out east when I lived in Nova Scotia. In fact, in the beginnings of these dreams, when I'd visit Nova Scotia, I'd go, look, God, where is this place I'm dreaming about? But then as it, the dreams unfailed over the years, um, I found myself exploring it. I can even draw out a plan, a floor plan of this place. It's so huge. And uh, it has two main floors and an entrance with a great circular stair, like a big winding staircase goes up, all beautiful woodwork inside and huge rooms going down the hall, makes a U and comes right back up the other hall. All these great big rooms, gorgeous, all decorated different ways. And I've been into the basement, I've been into the attic, I've been all over this place. And the first thing is, right from the beginning, uh, the lights were off and the heat was off. And it'd be like these videos you see on TV exploring the abandoned mansion, only this one's all furnished. And as I'd go into every room and, and some Sometimes in my dreams, I go into one room or a couple rooms and then different room and go into some other rooms. The rooms were from past revivals. I go into the Great Awakening Room and see all the furniture, all the things there that would have been at the time of Jonathan Edwards. I go into the Finney Revival Room. I go into, you know, like the, the, the uh, revival with the Wesleys and different rooms, large rooms and small rooms all around this massive mansion, two stories of it. It must be 100 rooms or something. I don't know. Huge. And uh, on the front of this building, on the street front, see the entrance was on the side street, but the main street had a, a partitioned off huge big section there, which was like a residence. And in my dreams, I finally took up residence there, opened up some rooms, found some secret rooms, um, <laughs> was down in the heating plant for the whole building. It, it leaked. Uh, fire wouldn't go up the chimney properly. Wildfires, you know, you know, it, it, very telling about revivals. All this crazy stuff in this dream. I just, as I'm telling you, I have pictures in my mind coming from the dream. And uh, we decided in my dream years ago, in previous, I don't know how many dreams ago, 
that we would live there, live by the revival. I want to live by revival, live beside it, waiting for it, waiting for it. And there was one door that would go into the big revival mansion and then the partition where we lived. And uh, time to time in my dreams, I'd go through that door into the revival mansion. It would be colder and lights off and I'd wander around. But I had the dream again the other night. And here's what happened. I go through the door from the back of our place that we're living into the revival mansion just beside where the stairs have sweeping stairs go around. The lights are on. The first thing that strikes me, I go in the door, the heat's on. It's never been on in my dream. The lights are on. It's never been on in my dream. And I look straight ahead and I see a doorway and there's a massive, massive room there that I've never seen before. And it's modern. It's not from hundreds of years ago. It's all white. It's all prepared. And there's somebody way in there, white-haired, tall, stately-looking gentleman, way in. And I'm thinking, do I recognize that person? And I thought, that's an angel preparing the room. And what I recognize from the dream is God's saying to me, that's the room for the next revival being prepared. It's here. The lights are on. The heat's on. Revival's coming soon. It's being prepared. And what I noticed, like, it's all about, it, it's, it's huge. It's funny, I'd never seen the room before. This room is huge and ready. Praise God. Thank you, Lord, for what you're doing and will do. And Father, raise up your workers to go into the harvest field in Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. God bless you guys.